Hello, good morning, welcome back to the Fish Locker out on the boat. Out on an absolute stunner of a morning on the boat. We have a very narrow weather window and I hope to take advantage of it. The first thing I need to do, I'm going out to try and do some wrecking today, we've got very small tides. I'm going to explore two new wrecks that I haven't tried before and then I'm going to try anchoring up or drifting over a wreck for some ling and some conger. The first thing I need to do though is I need to find some bait. What I'm looking for is the likes of that. Mackerel, pilchard, scad, anything like that. Some oily, scenty baits to use to get the ling out of the wrecks. I will explain if I'm a little bit later than I would like to be. <laughs> Life got in the way this morning, so I'm out at, what time are we on now? It is 20 to eight. Should have been out here about an hour ago, but yeah, that's what it is. It is what it is. Let's go find some bait and let's get going. I'll get myself a dozen mackerel, joeys, Pilchards, scad, something like that. I'll be over the moon. So that'll work perfectly. Pilchards! That's what's down there. Loads of pilchards. Ooh. That's a nice chunky one. That's what I'm after. This one is actually a herring. So we've got a herring and a pilchard. I'll show you really quickly what the difference is. Well, when I can go all of it. Herring. Uh, give me a sec. Herring and pilchard's heads are very similar. It's just the bottom jaw that's different. Now, pilchard scales and herring scales, they're both shiny, but pilchards have got larger scales for their size. The way to differentiate is where this dorsal fin is. With a herring, it's, for, it's behind the central line. Whereas with a pilchard, it's bang in the middle. I have plenty of bait now. Let's go out and see about these wrecks. I love seeing these guys. No matter how many times you see them, always brightens your day. I've got all the bait that I needed. I had a nice little play with some dolphins and I have made it to the first wreck that I want to have a look at. What I'm going to do is, even though they are small tides, and small tides don't lend themselves very well to fishing with soft plastics on booms, on wrecks, you generally need a bit of tide for that. I'm going to give it a go, just to see. Now these rigs that I use are dead simple. It is a three-way swivel, like that, so that it can spin round. Basically, it's it's a helicopter rig or a Portland rig, just without the boom. And I just connect the big lead to the bottom. Here we are in 74 meters of water, so I'm going to be using a 10, maybe even a 12. Might get away with lighter. I'll see what the first drift's like. But I've got eight to ten feet of fluoro. One of the reasons why I use fluoro is you see that this has been on a rig winder. And I don't know how well you can see this line, but it is in like a massive coil. Where it, when it's been coiled up, it stays like a slinky. With mono, once it's kinked, you can't get it out. But with fluoro, all you need to do is you just give it a pull through your fingers with a bit of tension, not too much, which will burn your fingers. And look, it just hangs flat. So all you do is you just run it through your fingers, like that, with a little bit of tension. And now your trace is all flat. No kinks in it. That's one of the beauties of fluoro. As it is, we are drifting at 0.4 knots. 
in a good direction. I will line myself up on the wreck now. Whenever I get to a wreck, I want to drift over. I generally, I'll try and guess which way it's going to go with the wind and the tide as to which way I'm going to drift over it. But you never know exactly. So I'll come up to a wreck and I'll, I'll knock the engine off and I'll let the boat drift. And that'll let me know which direction it's going to go. And then from that, I can plan my next drifts. Um, I might even get it on the first one. Right. The setup that I'm using here, my shadding, my polyking setup, is a Regiment 3 solid carbon and it's a 12 to 20. You just need a rod that has got some bend in it. Because Pollock, when they, when they bite, when they dive, they, they properly go. So you need a rod that can absorb the lunges. This is a Fathom lever drag. I have got, uh, I think this is 50 pound braid. It might be 45, somewhere around there. And then I've got a 60 pound mono leader on. And all I'm gonna do is I'll just connect the bottom of my three-way swivel. And then when I'm in the right position to drift over the wreck, throw the lure out, drop the lead down, you drop it all the way at the bottom, and as soon as you hit the bottom, you start winding. Just a steady wind. So that little lure is going to go all the way at the bottom, and then all the way up again, and all the way at the bottom, and all the way up again. If there are fish on this wreck, I'm not going to stay here stay here for long, I just want to test it out. Constantly trying new wrecks and new areas. So while I'm on my way to where I'm going to go, I'll try this one out. Drifts that slow, I might even get away with a jig on this wreck. Drifting really slow. Beautiful type of day to be drifting on wrecks for Ling. These conditions stay as they are. Try this drift with a jig. Just because the drift is so slack, I might be able to get away with it. We'll do this drift and then we'll go on, go on where we're going. Because if the conditions stay like this, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. Feels like a piece of netting. It definitely feels like a piece of netting. Yeah, that's what that is. So I feel it moving about on the bottom. Well, that's frustrating. There's no chance of getting that back now. Tell it's a piece of rope or a piece of net because there isn't a shark, it doesn't immediately get snagged, it pulls, it's got weight to it. You can feel I can feel moving it. Yeah. That means that there is probably a large piece of ghost net stuck on this wreck. That means that it's not a good wreck to fish. That's 10 quid gone. Let's get where we're going. I am where I want to be. I've just killed the engine just above the wreck and I'm gonna see where this drift's gonna take us because I am gonna try and drift on this wreck first. The rig that I'm gonna be using, I've just knocked up a one hook wrecking rig. A slightly smaller one to show you. There you are. It's just a scratching rig on steroids. It's a really, it's 200 pound mono, and I have got a 10 ohm meat hook, and I'm gonna be using a fillet of the fresh mackerel that I've just caught. I expect that I'm gonna be, we are in 78 meters of water. I'm expecting I'm gonna to have to use a 10 ounce of lead. And I'm gonna be using a heavier rod. I'm gonna be using a 3050 and a, a TLD, a TLD 20. What I'm going to do is I'll knock all the bait in the rig up 
and I'll run round the wreck and I'll show you it all just before I drop it down. Yeah. Big fish fishing. Same standard setup as before. I have a mainline braid this time of like 65 pound. Then I have a mono rubbing leader. On the end of that I have a swivel and I've just clipped on my trace which is baited with a mackerel flapper. That's it. I'm going to be right down on the wreck in the bottom so you've got to pay attention to what you're doing because you you are literally you're dropping all your rigs and your baits and everything into the snaggiest area possible this is where these fish live so you've got to be you've got to be on it I'm going to be feeling the bottom with the lead being right there I've hit bottom I know that I'm currently I'm not on the wreck I'm on the mud or the sand whatever's next to it because I can feel it's a soft thud with the lead. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep, keep tagging the bottom. Just going to keep lifting it a little bit and touching it until I can feel like a hard bang. And then I know I'm in wreckage. And then you've got to be really careful. Now the bites you get from Ling are proper bites. Like you will know. I've got a big bait and a big hook. So what you need to do is you need to kind of, I imagine in my mind like, the fish chasing it and the fish getting hold of it and by the pulls and the bangs what it's doing. And when you feel like you've got a proper good bite, you need to strike very hard because you need to set the hook into the fish and you need to get it up out of the wreck. So the first 10 seconds and 20 feet are crucial because you need to get it out of it, otherwise it's going to snag you up. Sometimes you knock them straight on the head. <laughs> Sometimes as soon as your bait gets down there, they're on it. And other times they'll chase it and they'll, they'll mouth it and you'll feel them tugging at it and you just have to kind of just let them take it. We'll have a couple more drifts down different parts of this wreck. And if it stays the way it is, because of the way that the wreck's laid, if I was going to anchor up, you're better off finding a wreck that's, that's laid across the tide not with the tide because if it's laid with the tide the slight little difference of wind or anything pushes you off it whereas if it's across it you've got more chance of landing on it come on then catch it check it what a proper like <clears throat> it feels like it feels like it's a ling or a conger eel but it's just not a massive one it's just chessing it Chasing it and getting old in it. You see the bites there? <laughs> yeah, this is a little fish. Well, I say a little fish, it could be, could be four pound. And it's chasing the bait, getting hold of it, and getting hold of it because it keeps tugging real hard. We're just not taking it. A real big one, like a 20 or a 30 pounder, would just go hum and just swallow it in one. Right, we'll try that drift again. If I hadn't had a single bite, I would have been less inclined to say we'll drift it again because we drifted right down the hole of the wreck then. Try one more. Have a look at what the bait's like as well. I reckon that the tails of the bait will have been all chewed off. So it's well and truly chewed that up, haven't they? Get it next time. Unfortunately, in the last 10 minutes, I don't know if you've noticed that the wind's really picked up. And we've now got wind against tide. So my bait's wanting to go that way in the tide and the wind's pushing the boat this way. Try it once more. If, there was, if this wind continues to build in this direction, we're going to have to look for a different wreck. Because we can't anchor it because we've got exactly wind against tide. That's a shame, <laughs> that's a shame. That first drift that we had on here was beautiful. Just shows how a little bit of a change in the conditions, just that wind, that wind picking up by a couple of miles an hour. Spoils everything. Come to a different wreck that's orientated slightly differently in the tide. Whoa. 
fresh bait, we'll give this one a try. Unfortunately, that's just kind of what happened when you, you saw when we first come out that the wind was next to nothing. It, it's forecasted to be two or three mile an hour. Right now, it's more like 10 or 12. Just got to try and adapt to what's going on. Now, we've got wind going that way and tide going that way. So we have exactly wind against tide, which is the worst conditions possible for what I wanted to do. But we'll see what we can do. If I can manage to winkle a fish out like this on the drift, that's brilliant. Because I can't really put the anchor down. I can put it down, but we would just be swinging about all over the place until the tide turns. When then we would have wind and tide together, but that's in like three hours' time. So I'm going to try and play along and try and catch something on the drift. If I can, brilliant. If I can't, I'll give it a couple of goes and then we'll try and put the anchor down, fight through it. So that when the tide turns, we'll have wind and tide together. It's kind of the plan. The first time I've been out to the wrecks in probably three or four months. So you don't know which wrecks are fishing well, you don't know which wrecks have had nets on them, you don't. Yeah. First day back is always the one where you're having to figure it all out. Anchor time. Because we are in rather deep water now, we're in 80 metres of water. I'm going to be using a lot of rope. <laughs> I keep my rope in two separate coils. When I know I'm going to extra deep water, I bring two coils with me. Normally I'll just keep one on the boat. It keeps the weight down and it keeps space on the boat. Yeah, I'm going to be using a 5 kilo Bruce anchor and about 20 feet of chain. I'm going to be using an Alderney ring and a boy for the anchor. Now, uh, it's it's never certain if you're going to get it right first time in good conditions. So there's every good chance that I might have to re-anchor it two or three times to try and get it right, just by the way that the wind and the tide are laid. But I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> going to give it a go? Yeah. Let's give it a go. Keep me warm at least, because that wind is cold. There we go. All I do is just join the two coils together. Put up some more. I have my ropes marked by length. Every white band is 100 feet, so that's 300 feet. And then every 50, there is a black, black mark. Where is it? There, look. So that's how, that's how I know how much I'm putting out. I'll let that bed down. Let that pull tight there. That'll bed the anchor in, and then I'm going to pass the rope round the front, tie it off, let this go, and we'll swing round. The reason why I work it all down here is so that I've got extra space. Go through them little tiny hatches. If you've got broad shoulders or you are larger in the front, it's quite hard sometimes to work out that little hatch. So I work it all off the back. But these are uh, these are neap tides. Could be a bit dangerous if you were doing it in spring tides, working it all off the back. This is a really weird way to be laid on a wreck. My anchor's over there. I'm like laid out this way. The wreck is up there and my lines from the back of the boat are going back that way. So I've had to anchor myself past the wreck so my lines drop back towards it. If I manage to pluck out a fish here, <laughs> I'll feel like I've really earned them. 
this is <laughs> this is a situation where I'm, I'm kind of I'm all the way out here now, and I don't want to have to turn all the way back and go go home without without giving it a proper try. So I'm I'm just trying to make the best of it. Another bit of old net. I'll let out a little bit more rope and move my position on the wreck here. Some days they just make you work that little bit harder. The baits keep getting pecked up. So I thought, alright, oh, maybe pouting. What I'll do to try and find out what it is, whiting or pouting, I'll stick a slow jig on and I'll drop a jig down. And almost instantly, as soon as it hit the bottom, I hadn't even had a chance to turn the camera on. Yeah. The nice whiting, I don't mind keeping whiting, whiting are delicious. Pouting though, they're not much good for anything else other than bait. Pot bait or lingon conga bait. Oh. Fought all the way to the boat and then jumped out. Pouting. It's funny sometimes how they come up and they're stripy, isn't it? Often you only see them when they're when they're like that big and they're stripy. You're gonna go back. Yeah, he is, you know. Brought him up slow on that, that jig and he went straight back. It feels like a little pouting. I'm going to keep hold of this one, I'm going to use this one as bait. That last one was a was a chunky one. I would have had to have filleted it off. This one's a small one, I'll use it as a whole bait. I was just looking there at my rod tip and I just thought, oh, what's, that, what's wrong with my line? And right next to the rod tip I was looking at it and it's all when you're finished. It's all like massively frayed up, look. And I thought, what's that? Because I thought, is it a damage in the braid or is it some? And then when I've looked, porcelain in my tip eye is cracked. So as the boat's been yawing up and down, look, it's doing it again there. As the boat's been yawing up and down like that, it's been wearing the line away through the, very lucky that I spotted that because that would have just parted my braid off. I'm gonna have to retire this rod and put a new eye on. Just having to work that bit harder today. There's the damaged section of braid. So it's cut it almost right down to the cut it through. And there is the damage. There look, there's the damage. Oh hello. I'm busy trying to tie that braid up and I've got a it looks like quite a nice bite on this rod. Oh flipping it. All that. All that messing around in 80 plus metres of water for a flipping dogfish. Needless to say, that's not what I want. Oh, that feels better. That feels a little bit better. I'm not talking too much because I'm just concentrating on trying to get into the boat. It's on the lightest rod and if it's a ling, it might not have set the hook properly into it. The way that it's firing around, I'm not confident that it is a ling. It feels more like a conger reel. But 
fish is a fish. Where are you? Come on. Up you come. Yes! Oh, yes! <laughs> oh, thank goodness. So I wasn't confident. I wasn't confident this was a ling then. I'd uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll show you the rig in just a second once I stop this guy from nearly biting my hand off. Ooh. We got one. We got one, we got what we came for. Flipping heck. This trace is a really light one with a small hook. Cause I thought if the fish had been finicky, saying that he's got it right down there, he's got it right down his gullet. I thought if the fish had been finicky, I'm gonna need to go down to a smaller rig. He's been, so it's been raxing these guys up. It's covered in scratches. Sit in that live bait tank for two seconds. Sit him in that live bait tank for two minutes and let him calm down. Right, I've got a spare one of them rigs here. This is it. That hook is like a four row with a lighter trace because I thought there might be a spur dog, there might be a smoke down, there might be something else down there around the wreck. And I can't catch it on the ten o's with the, with the full flappers, so I put a little strip of mackerel down, like half of half of one of these down on a four row and I was busy letting this other rod down I've just I've had time to rig up another rig just because I'm gonna have to retire that that other rod there that rod with a damaged eye I've still I'm still using it at the minute I've got it laid out but if it gets much worse I'm gonna have to put it away so I've rigged up another rod I was just dropping it down and looked over and I saw the rod tip going I thought I've got you dropped to the bottom picked up yeah, this is the lightest rod. This is the 12 to 20. I don't, I don't use these 12 20s for wrecking. I use them for shadding. I don't use them for like dragging congas and ling out, just because they've got such hard heads and you've got to get them out of the wreck that the rod's too, too flexible for it. Yeah, managed to get it out, and it's a cracker of a ling as well. <laughs> I earned that one. Ah, you earned that one. Whew. Scratched all my fingers up as well. Yeah, sometimes the fishing's easy. Sometimes it's just a doddle. On other days you really have to work. And today I'm really having to work for it. So getting the target species, I am buzzing. I'm gonna get that fish dispatched and bled now. And I'll show you through all the rigs. <sighs> yes. Of course I've managed to pick up that ling on a smaller bait, on a little one. I'm rigging up another one, but I'm beefing it up slightly <laughs> because I was very lucky to get that. So what I've done is I've made myself, this is 80 pound. I'm not gonna go all the way out and, and going mega strong, just because if they're being really finicky, they might not want it. And this is a 6-0. And all I did before was I just took one of the fillets and sliced it diagonally and just kinda, just, Easy. This hook actually could do with a bit of a sharpen. Just threaded it through a couple of times like that. And then there. Just a little bit of flapping bait like that. Hook could definitely do with a bit of a sharpen. Also, you check check your line because these this area where we're fishing we're fishing into a, a shipwreck it's going to be snaggy it's going to be rough it's going to be sharp it damages your line it damages your hooks and all i did with it was i had a six ounce leg just on a little sliding ledger like that the reason why i went for a six ounce whereas the other ones are heavy is because 
I wanted it to be a couple of inches, a couple of feet off the bottom. So I flicked it out and just let it drift. There's not as much chance of it snagging in the wreck because it's not on the bottom. The lead isn't heavy enough in the tide to hold the bait to the bottom. It's just going to be drifting up in the tide, so the bait's going to be, hopefully, flapping around. So this was maybe a foot, two foot off the bottom, and a lynx technique. So I am over the moon! <laughs> it's amazing what it does for your morale. I was, I was really struggling, I was just kind of thinking, oh, I don't know Just lost gear and nets and wind against tide, but yeah, one good fish. It sharps, perks you back up. Oh, that's a good bite there. You can see now with this ling, I've dispatched and bled, the colour has dropped right out of it. Bleeding a fish like that vastly improves the meat. Now I won't, I won't show that in the videos because I know that some of the viewers don't like to see it. But I do think that if you are going to keep your fish for the table, you should, you should humanely dispatch them and you should bleed them. If you want to know how to do that, Google Ick Jimmy or Ike Jimmy. It vastly, vastly improves the, the, the quality of the meat that you get. And I think that if you're going to be, if you're going to be taking something, if you're going to be harvesting something like this, you owe it to it to get the most and to get the best from it. Just chewing at the tail end of it. Part of the problem I've had today is just because you can see the boats bang up and down and it's swinging from side to side. You can't keep the baits in good contact with the bottom and you can't keep the scent going in the same place. I mean, I'm, I'm swinging probably 30 metres up on the wreck. So I'm having to leave a bit of slack line so I'm not dragging my baits, dragging my hooks into the wreck. So as I'm coming round, I'm missing bites. And also, I'll be running nice scent through a bit of a wreck, and then I'll move and I'll be 20 metres away running it somewhere else. One of those days where you've just got to chip away at it. Ideal perfect conditions for doing this is wind and tide perfectly together, or no wind at all. So it's just the tide that's acting on you. Tide's swinging round and the, the wind's pitched a bit. So we're actually, we're off the wreck, so I'm gonna have to pull the anchor up and re-anchor for the remainder of the tide. I was hoping it was gonna get away with it, but it's not hardship. Get that anchor pulled up now. <laughs> Two mile an hour wind my backside. Got the anchor pulled, <laughs> got it sat back, and someone thought it'd be a really good idea to come and come and sit right next to me. So I pulled the anchor back up, and I've steamed about four miles further offshore, and I'm going to try a different wreck. Hopefully, they won't bother following me. That wreck wasn't fishing very well anyway. I let him have it. Everything is quite funny when that happens. Like, oh, he must be catching fish on that wreck. Okay, you can have it. Fished you for four hours and had one fish out of it. You, you can have that one. I'll take a different one. Let's get a hook down. Get some fresh bait cut. Add the bait the second it hit the bottom. Another pouting. That is a good sign though, because if there's plenty of pouting down there, there's plenty of small fish, that's food for big fish. So if we're catching pouting, there will be bigger fish, there will be conger, there will be ling down there. Just need to just need to get them out on the feed. I need to sort that snag out. When I've got hold of it with the glove, I can feel the fish pulling on the end. 
Right, it's a little eel that's got hold of the bait and backed into a hole. Now there's, there's two things you can do in that scenario. I mean, we're not we're not got much of a chance today because we're smashing around here. But you can let off a little bit of slack and watch for a bite and hope that the fish comes out of the snag or you just pull for a break. And with the lighter rod like this, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Yeah, them baits are just getting absolutely mullered. Because the pouting are just absolutely destroying me, I've just taken a fillet off the side of the pouting, I'm gonna send that down with you. If we were sat, if we were sat absolutely flat calm on a lovely calm day, you'd be able to see the tiniest little bits of bite. Because we're throwing around like this now, it's just, you're up against it. Just do our best. That's all you can do, I guess. Yeah, of course it was. This one's actually a really dark one, isn't it? That is a proper warrior of a pouting. I'm not surprised because there's plenty of eels down there on this wreck. I just can't get them out of it. Just had like a little knocking bite. I thought, oh, it's a flipping pouting again. So the stroke kind of started winding up and all of a sudden it just went like, so oh, maybe it's not a pouting. And then come light again and I thought, ah, oh, flip, it's come off. And I brought a pouting up. But it was a pouting, but looks like possibly even a shark's had hold of it. See the size there, that bite mark? That looks to me like a little poor beagle shark. Yeah. Mouth about that wide. Which, <laughs> which actually is another reason why I want to knock it on the head. Now this pouting is dead. That pouting, I'm gonna try and turn that into a lobster. But yeah, a lot of motion, not a very good sit on the wreck. And now there's a poor beagle down there as well. Thought when I was bringing it in, I was like, oh, nice, nice one, this one. Yeah, and then dropped off, thought. Let's go. We're back in now, I'm all tidied down. All we have to do now is fill it, Mr. Ling. Now, I gutted it while we're at sea and I bled it straight away. So all we need to do now is we need to take the fillets off. They're not the easiest fish to fillet because they roll around a bit and they're quite slimy. This one's not a bad size, this one's this one's just into double figures. But when you get um, when you get a real big one, it can be a bit of a handful sometimes. all you do I'm not pulling this I'm not pulling the skin I'm just holding it back and then working the knife up right where the end of the bella cavity is I'll go straight through right. I'll work this out in two sets Right. 
there's the first part now the second part I've already run through to the as far as the bones will go Seagulls have spotted it. Here's the next one. So by doing it in two halves, by dealing with this section and this section, it makes it so much easier because you've got the loin. This piece here is the loin. This piece here is just like a normal fillet, like you get off a pollock. And it should just come out like that. There look. You've taken the line of bones out the middle. And all you've lost there is a couple of millimetres of flesh and it's all got the bones in. There you go, perfect fillet, no bones in. And this one here, all the bones just run down along the side of the loin. And then just... There you go. There's your loin. Now this belly meat here, this has still got a bit of meat in, but this this is where all the worms will be. Like, there's one, there's one. What I'm going to do is I use this in the lobster pots. If you're going to bake it all, you could make it, you could use it in a pie, but this is the main of the meat. There's a fillet, and that is all just meat there, that, that loin. No bones in any of it, no mess, perfect. No meat left on that. Let's get started on the other side. There you go. There's the two tail sections. See by V-boning them out, no bones whatsoever in there. And these two loin sections here, just a stunning cross section of meat. Yeah. By bleeding the fish, you do end up with a fantastic quality fish afterwards. These two belly strips, you can see that these are where all the bones are left, where it was connected to the loin. These are where you end up with most of your worms up inside the belly cavity. Yeah, look. Now these and this, there's next to an out left on that. That seagull's eyeing it up, I can hear him. There's no, next to an out left on that, but I'm gonna try and turn that into a lobster. And that is coming home. And there's the finished product. Tea and dinner for us. We'll drop that off to Jim later on in the week. It was a hard day's fishing, but that's the reality of fishing at this time of year. I hope you enjoyed joining us. I hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later.